I want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel Grants Pass, where it is our desire to go deeper in the Word, deeper in prayer, going further as we go deeper from these walls. As he had spoke about the Refuge Center, it is a great opportunity. Here we study the Bible line upon line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Please turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit, chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Now, on Sunday, we did not cover Acts. We uh, were on another topic, so I just want to do a, just a small little bit of review. We're going to pick it up in verse 11. Acts chapter 10, verse 11. And saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and led down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Verse 16. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Verse 17. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. Verse 19. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Verse 21. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Verse 23. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Father in heaven, we come before you this evening. We need to hear from you, Lord. I just pray that by your spirit that you speak to us, that you touch us, Lord. That you cleanse away, cut away that of which is of the world, unclean, Lord. We just want to hear from you. Be filled with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The A Apostle Peter, currently in Joppa, after resurrecting the beloved Tabitha, Dorcas, telling her on her deathbed, Tabitha, arise, get up, insinuating that her good works were not done. Her ministry was not completed, finished. She was still to be used by God. Though scripture says she was full of good works, God was not done using her. She lived a full life, done many good works, but her mission for God was not yet fulfilled. She still had purpose. It's interesting to me that after Tabitha died, that the Joppa disciples thought it appropriate, even urgent, that they notify Peter in Luda of her death and ask that he would not delay to come to them. Chapter 9, verse 38. Such actions suggest that Peter must have known Tabitha and or that she held some sort of position of respect in his life or within the church. Understanding this fact may help explain why Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, refers to her by both her Aramaic name Tabitha and her Greek name Dorcas. The fact that she was recognized by both names may indicate that she was well known to the Gentiles and to the Jews. She probably had been dead at least a day or two by the time that Peter reached her. See, the Joppa disciples, they had to walk the 12 miles from Joppa to Luda to summon Pete, and then they all had to walk back the 12 miles. I don't think it is any coincidence that Tabitha's story is sandwiched between the stories of Saul's conversion in Acts chapter 9 
And the story of Cornelius seeking God in chapter 10, and then Peter's revelation in chapter 10 that the gospel should go forth to the Gentiles. The placement of Tabitha's story, it indicates that she played an important role. Her resurrection, her good works, in preparing the Jews and the Gentiles to receive the gospel. And Scripture says this act of the Holy Spirit of resurrecting her, raising her from the dead, was known throughout the city, and many believed in the Lord. God using miracles to verify the authority, the power of his apostles, just as he did with his son Jesus while he was here on earth. Is God incarnate? And miracles are still happening today. The Holy Spirit drawing hearts back to God, bringing the spiritually dead back to the living, changed hearts, changed lives. God is not dead, He's alive. And His Spirit is moving today, speaking to believers and non believers creating divine meetings to bring all together, continuing the purpose of Jesus to testify, to glorify God. Peter, Stephen, Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch, Saul, Ananias, Barnabas, Aeneas, Tabitha, Cornelius, Simon, a tanner, all for the glory of God. If I were to ask you what the mission of the church is or what your purpose is, how would you answer? Please turn with me to Mark chapter 16. I guarantee this will all tie in. And if not, you can stone me. Mark chapter 16. Second book in the New Testament, chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verses 14. We'll pick it up there. Verse 14. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up servants, and if they drink anything diddly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. The word amen means so be it. Although the church, it accomplishes many tasks, its only message to the world is the gospel of Christ. Everything else is merely an extension of that primary goal. And the gospel that we offer to the lost is superior to every worldly philosophy. It is never outdated or in need of correction. It is always sufficient. There is no new revelation to meet humanity's greatest need, which is reconciliation with the Creator. That is what is needed. Reconciliation with God through belief in the name of Jesus. Although the message is always the same, Methods of making it known are many, including the spoken word, music, printed material, electronic media. But all these avenues of communication require the individual involvement of what? Of God's people. It is every Christian's responsibility to use his or her spiritual gifts, talents, abilities to help fulfill the Great Commission. Going further as we go deeper. Now, some think, and this has actually been told to me, that this role is given only to pastors, missionaries, or other P 
people with upfront ministry. All of us, all of us have a responsibility to be involved in whatever way that we are able. And in whatever opportunity God gives us, not everybody is called to go abroad as a missionary. How many missionaries do you know? Look around. Each one of us, we are called to be missionaries. Really. Not everybody is called to preach, teach, lead worship, but we all have a part in God's church. Leadership here at Calvary Chapel Grants Pass, we encourage all to get involved however you can. Opportunities abound. Many openings with children's ministry, hospitality ministry, convalescent ministry, prayer ministry, food pantry, refuge center, street ministry. God has a place for every one of us. Nobody is insignificant or unusable. The limiting factor is not the Lord's ability to use us, but our availability to his call. Are you picking up God's call? Or are you letting the machine get it? Voicemail. Leave a message, God, I'll get back to you. We joke about it, but seriously. We are all to give, to pray, to be missionaries. Telling others what the Lord has done for us. When we're truly committed to getting the gospel out, God will reveal what work he is calling us to do when we seek him. Amen. Peter, staying with Simon, a tanner. Scripture says around noon, chapter 10, seeking solitude, he goes up to the rooftop to pray, seeking guidance. He wants to hear from God. And there God reveals himself and give gives Peter his next step through a vision. Verse 11, And saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet, bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Verse 16, This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now remember, prior to these verses with Peter, God gave Cornelius a vision. Cornelius, the Roman centurion, who was a devout man of prayer, one seeking God also. He recognized that the God of the Hebrews was the true God. He just didn't know about the new revelation of that God, which is Jesus the Christ. So God gave Cornelius a vision and go, Go get Peter. Send for Peter. And Peter, he's going to show you what to do next. Cornelius, a Gentile, a Roman centurion Gentile. Understand that Jews, they kept to themselves. The Jews view Gentiles as pagans. The Hebrew word for Gentiles is goyim. It means non-Jew people, nations. From the Jewish perspective, Gentiles were often seen as pagans who did not know the true God. During Jesus' time, many Jews took such pride in their cultural and religious heritage, they, they considered Gentiles unclean. They called them dogs and the uncircumcision, heathens. Gentiles and the half-Gentile Samaritans were viewed as enemies to be shunned. A Jew would never enter the home of a Gentile or really any area which was considered solely Gentile. That's why the priests, when seeking the death penalty of Jesus, they wouldn't enter the Roman hall to speak with the governor, Pontius Pilate. John chapter 18, verse 28 reads, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, 
but that they might eat the Passover. See, if they entered the Roman praetorium, the Roman hall, to argue to kill Jesus, it would make them unclean. The Jews are very particular, peculiar people. After the Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, the conditions, the land convinced most Jews to leave the land and disperse. And yet wherever they went, Jews lived for the most part, they, they segregated themselves from the customs, the culture of that new country, that new habitat, keeping strictly with their own customs, their own laws, their own heritage, their own religion. And though they no longer had a nation, a country, a home to call their own, they were still Jews. And they held to their Jewish roots. They kept their identities, their nationality. Why? Because they're God's chosen people and God is not done with them. That is why we can believe in God. He predicted through his prophet Ezekiel thousands of years ago that in the last days, his people would all be in one place together, their own nation again. The rebirth of Israel in 1948 is the single greatest prophecy that we are in the last days. The Jewish people, they'd been scattered across the whole world for centuries, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years with no homeland. And the geographical area that used to be Israel had been decimated by war. The American writer Samuel Clemens, otherwise known as Mark Twain, said about 150 years ago that the area was desolate and devoid of inhabitants. Riding on horseback through the Jezreel Valley, Twain observed, there is not a solitary village throughout its whole extent, not for 30 miles in either direction, there are two or three small clusters of Bedouin tents, but not a single permanent habitation. One may ride 10 miles hereabouts and not see 10 human beings. End quote. The place was desolate, barren, decimated. Yet today, only 72 years after the rebirth of Israel. It is green. It is lavish. Huge crop industry. Did you know that it is considered the fifth in the world in technology, Israel? Also, I didn't know this, it is considered the eighth most powerful nation in the world. It's smaller than New Jersey. No other nationality. People have ever done that in all of history, to have been scattered and then to come back. It is a testament to our God. God knows what he is doing, and he, he's got a plan. He's got a plan. And Cornelius, seeking God, is told to go find Peter and bring him back. And though Peter, he's a changed man, he would still resist entering Cornelius' house. See, he needed intervention. Legalism dies hard. And Peter would need to have the old laws and the old man die. Hence, the vision from God of the sheet with all different types of animals, clean and unclean on it. Verse 12. And then the voice told him to arise, kill and eat. Verse 13. In Leviticus chapter 11 tells us that the Jews have strict food laws. Generally speaking, the Jew might eat only animals which chew the cud and whose huffs were cloven. All others were unclean and forbidden. Peter, he was shocked initially by the vision and he protested to God. <laughs> Not so, Lord! <laughs> that he had never eaten anything unclean. And the voice told him not to call what God had Cleansed, unclean. And this happened three times. Why three times? So that there could be no possible mistake or dodging 
of the lesson. Before the vision, Peter would have called a Gentile unclean, but now God was telling him, not so. And even though he didn't understand that the vision was to let him know that he and other Jewish Christians were permitted now to enter the homes of the Gentiles to bring them the good news, the gospel of Jesus, Peter would understand in time. God was preparing him for the visitors who would come. Remember, Peter, Pete has no idea at this moment of Cornelius or his messengers who are almost at the gate to see him. Verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Peter, he was now wide awake, up on the roof. He could probably hear the sounds of the tanner below him working. And because he was hungry, the smells of lunch sizzling in the pan. Scripture says in that verse, he wondered. Other translations doubted, was perplexed concerning the vision. Peter's stomach rumbled. And though God was using the Jewish dietary laws to bring the point home to Peter, he still didn't get it. Peter doubted himself. He wondered, was very perplexed. How many times in seeking to do God's work do we doubt? Wonder what is in store for us are perplexed by God's words, either in Scripture or to us. We need to just trust and believe all will work together for those who love God. God loves us, and he has a plan for each one of us. We just need to trust. So many things happen that I don't understand, and I just have to give it up to God. And the enemy is going to throw things at us all the time. Why? To get our focus off of God, off of Jesus and onto ourselves. Today, both vehicles that we had planned on using to go for this trip didn't work out. Well, actually one yesterday and another one today at the last minute. So we had to figure that out. But God has a plan. It all worked out great. It all worked out for the best. It's only money, right? We rented a van and another car. God's good. God will provide. He always does. He always does. We just need to trust. Cornelius men, they were at the gate, and they call for Peter. Verse 18. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. Verse 19. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Verse 19. Thought. It means to ponder, to deliberate. Peter was thoroughly seeking God, and he was trying to figure out what God was saying to him. We are to meditate. We are to deliberate. We are to contemplate. The words of God, Psalm chapter 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he, on his law, he meditates day and night. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. His book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have. Good success. The word meditate in these verses here in the Old Testament is the Hebrew equivalent of thought in verse 19. In Acts chapter 10, we are to meditate, we are to ponder on the word of God. We are to pick it apart, to dissect it. We are to understand it. Why? It is life to us. His word, God's word, it is a light and it is life to us. Here the Spirit of God shows God's will to Peter. These men are seeking you. Arise, go with them. 
Now, verse 13 earlier in our chapter says, a voice came to him, arise, kill and eat. Here it states the, the spirit said to him. It gives the impression an audible voice, doubting nothing. Don't doubt Peter. It's not in your head, Peter. You're not losing it. You're not hallucinating. This is real. They're here for you. Arise, go. I've got it under control. The Greek word arise, anestomy, means to rise up from lying down, to go to another place. Prepare yourself for a journey. It implies that you're starting something new, something different from one place to another. It is the same word that Peter used with Tabitha. Rise up, anestomy, Tabitha, from death to life. Something new, Peter. I sent them. And you're going to start something new. It is important for us to know, to remember that when we are at a crossroad in our lives, we are not sure what to do next. We must remind ourselves that we have an active living God, an active living God. When we see God, the Holy Spirit is actively involved and will enable us to make the right decision if we will listen and wait on him. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do you believe what you say you believe? If so, then live it. Listen and obey. Verse 21. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? Now imagine the stir in the house when the tanner's wife went to the door and saw these strangers standing there at the gate. They were obviously Romans, and one was a soldier. Roman soldiers did not usually socially visit, visit Jewish tanners. just didn't happen. The initial reaction was probably fright. Romans are at the gate, and one's a soldier. Not looking good. So Peter, he hurries downstairs. Though he doesn't know why, he knows that they are there for him. The Holy Spirit had already told him not to doubt and to go with them. He just didn't know why. And he says, for what reason have you come? Well, hey, why are you guys here? What's up? I just love Peter. <laughs> because I so relate to Peter. I'm sure Peter's mind was racing. If I was there and I was Peter, my mind would have been going crazy trying to figure out what was going on. I can imagine if standing next to Peter, you could hear the wheels turning <laughs> in his brain, maybe even grinding. Okay, um, okay, God showed me the vision and spoke three times. There were three guys here standing at the gate. The Romans, Gentiles, eat unclean, forbidden food. They eat food offered to their idols, eat food with blood. I'm supposed to go with them. Maybe the vision has to do with these guys, these Gentiles. Okay, so wait. Okay, hold on, God. So the clean animals maybe represent Jews, and the unclean animals, Gentiles. But now no difference. Maybe the sheet represents the church. <laughs> Light was dawning fast on Peter. How much Peter grasped at this time is really difficult to say. 
That he grabs it fully in due time is evident from his own words that he would later speak. I would have loved just to have been there. <laughs> Verse 22, and they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. So Cornelius' messengers thoroughly explained to Peter what had happened to Cornelius. Note how they described to Peter that Cornelius, he's devout, just, God-fearing, a man with good reputation, and that he, Cornelius, was instructed divinely by an angel to seek Peter with an invitation to come to his house. Cornelius wants to hear words from you, Peter. A Gentile, a centurion, no less, wants to hear the gospel. This was new for Peter. Something he had never done before, somewhere he had never gone before to a Gentile's house. Arise therefore and go. Peter's mind must have been spinning on the inside. God gave me a vision. God gave Cornelius a vision. This must be of you, God. Verse 23, then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So, again, it was noon, lunchtime, time to eat, time for food. And Peter here does something unique, new for a Jew. He invites the Gentiles in to lodge. The word lodge means to entertain, to stay the night. He welcomes the visitors into the house as guests. They all sit down to eat the prepared meal. Imagine how the Romans must have felt. They knew the prejudices of the Jews. I'm sure they were hesitant as to how they would be received. That's why Cornelius made sure that his messengers explained thoroughly what had happened. And imagine how anyone who has suddenly been called to entertain at a table of total strangers, if that's ever happened, now you know how Peter, Simon the Tanner, maybe his wife, family, must have felt awkward. Awkward. At first, maybe just talk of the weather as the mashed potatoes and the gravy go around the lazy Susan. The conversation stilted, formal, so you're a soldier. Yeah, you, yeah. Fisherman by trade. How's the leather market doing around here? You doing all right? Gradually, the conversation at atmosphere would probably thaw. And soon, I'm sure, interesting information would flow back and forth across the table. You see, they did have something in common. Remember Cornelius' house and this devout soldier, as Scripture tells us, they were God-fearing also. They just didn't know personally the new revelation, Jesus, the Messiah. After the meal and the good conversation, time did not permit traveling, so all are lodged. And the next day, Peter, along with some believers from Joppa, they started the journey to Caesarea. These God-fearing Romans did not know Christ yet, but they soon would. The unity of believers, the fellowship of Jews and Gentiles, starting to blossom. The American theologian James Montgomery Boyce said, no Orthodox Jew would have invited Gentiles into his house he would not have sat down at the same table with them. He would not have had fellowship with them. It was forbidden. Jesus speaking to his disciples, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Holy Spirit was changing. Peter, we, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to do the same with us. We need to let the old law, the old man, Die. Romans chapter 6. Why don't you turn there? Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 14. We're going to end like 
in with this since I'm running out of time. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 14, tells us, tells us that we do not have to be chained to sin. We can let the old man sin die. Romans 6, starting in verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Verse 8. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Verse 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. We're under grace because Jesus died on a cross for all of us. Now, this doesn't say that we should go out and sin. No, the opposite. Because of what Christ did for us, in reverence, we should humbly come to him and we should not sin. Not sin. To honor him, to glorify him. We don't have to be chained to our sin. New creations, new creatures. Let the old man die. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you, and I just thank you, Lord, just for your words this evening. I just praise you, God, for who you are. I thank you for your son, that you sent him to us, and that, Jesus, you willingly came, and you lived a perfect life. Even though you were tempted with everything, you said, no, no. I'm not going to do it. And I thank you, Father, that you have given us your spirit, that through your spirit we can say no to sin, Lord. Your strength, it is not of us, not by our might nor by our power, but by your strength, Lord. We just praise you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless. If anybody needs prayer, please come forward.